Well, I have had fun with everybody this morning. Thanks to Pastor Eric for uh, that little display. It was fun to see the dry ice doing its stuff, and we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Ecclesiastes. If you go halfway to your Bible and you kind of go halfway, you'll probably find the book of Psalms. And if you go right past the Psalms to the book of Proverbs, one past Proverbs is the book of Ecclesiastes. And you probably have to wipe the dust off that one because you probably haven't read that one in a while. And uh, it is a great book. We're going to have a chance to learn more about that book in just a minute. Uh, I will tell you, uh, one way to fire me up is to call this the book of Ecclesiastics. There are some that call this book the book of Ecclesiastics. And if you want to fire me up, you just you call that book that. I dare you. I've told you how to poke the bear now, right? So that's all I'm going to hear now for the next few weeks. Is people are going to say, oh, yeah, I'm glad we're studying Ecclesiastics. Uh, this is not a book about calisthenics. It's not a book about athletics. It's a book about wisdom, and the name of the book is Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes. And we're going to have a chance to learn more about this awesome book. Now, it's a difficult book to oftentimes understand. Um, it's a, a highly ethereal book. It's a book that sometimes uh, can seem pessimistic. And so, again, I'm the first to admit this is not the easiest book in the Bible to study. I think it has some rewards when we go to it but I think we have to have the right perspective about it. I love one of the quotes by Jeffrey Myers. I have that up here for you. Let me read it for you. It says this. The wisdom of Ecclesiastes has fascinated people whether they have understood it or not. They can be enthralled by the book's literary beauty but astonished at the elusive nature of its content. As a result, the book as a whole remains for many an incomprehensible mystery, a huge conundrum smack in the middle of the Holy Scriptures. I hope that by the time we're done with the book of Ecclesiastes, that's not your experience. I hope that you say, wow, there were some really some valuable things for me in that book. And uh, there's, it's about biblical wisdom, God's wisdom. And so I hope you'll come away from it saying, I have a better understanding of perhaps God's wisdom as a result of uh, studying this book. We're going to continue today or begin today in chapter 1. And we're going to cover the first 14 verses today. And so your Bibles are open there, or perhaps you have your app open there. I would encourage you to keep your Bible open there, keep your app open there, because we're going to be in several different portions of this today. And this first chapter, you don't get this first chapter, the rest of the book kind of uh, falls off. You got to get this first chapter, because there's some things happening this week that are going to be instrumental for weeks to come. Here's the way that Ecclesiastes starts. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuit, circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it said, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will be, there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem and applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that's done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after wind. We come to you this morning, Lord, as we begin this brand new book, and we uh, open our ears, we... Uh, Open our eyes to see and to hear what you have for us. Would you teach us from this ancient book 
this book of great wisdom. We want to learn about you and about the world that's around us as a result of this book. And so we open ourselves right now. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, in verses one and two, we get a big clue as to the author of this book and the purpose of this book. And I've got uh, behind me on the screen here the verses 1 and 12, just so you can see that again. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, again, there's not many candidates that could fulfill that description. And most people believe that, therefore, Solomon is the one that wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. He's the son of David. He was the king in Jerusalem. And again, there's not many people that can claim that. And so again, there's not a complete consensus with everybody that thinks that Solomon wrote it. Some believe that perhaps uh, he was positioned as they were pre pretending to be uh, Solomon and, and they were writing as if they were Solomon. But I think that the uh, longstanding idea that Solomon is the writer really corresponds quite well with the uh, initial introduction to the book. So I'm going to... to posit that as we move forward. He also tells us his purpose and he says, I want to use wisdom to explore many avenues of life and to learn about what life is really like. And so I have a list of things that he's going to be uh, talking about. He's going to be talking about in coming weeks pleasure and work and friendship and wealth, status, appetites, injustice, and even the aging process and death all of those are going to be covered in the coming weeks through the book of Ecclesiastes. And that's why we're going to be availing ourselves of that because it matters in different aspects of our lives. Now again, back to the author again. He calls himself in, in the ESV the preacher. Uh, that word in Hebrew is koheleth. And koheleth means an assembly or it means an individual that gathers an assembly together. And so the Hebrew word koheleth is translated oftentimes as teacher or preacher, in this case preacher, and we're told again that this is an individual who has gathered everybody together to teach them about wisdom. Ekklesia is the Greek word, some of you know the ecclesiology is our doctrine of the church. Ecclesia is the gathering of the church and we are called the ecclesia, the fellowship of believers here in Greek, and the Greek word is the one we use for this book. So Koheleth is the author, and he means the gatherer together of peoples. Uh, in Greek, it would be Ekklesia, and so Ecclesiastes is the name of the book, and that's how we got the name of the book uh, from its title. Now, there is, again, some doubt about uh, Solomon writing this, especially near the end of his life, because let's face it, Solomon had some problems. He committed all kinds of uh, spiritual and physical idolatry. Uh, he had disappeared at times and, and just kind of backed away from faith as it seems, and, and he was disappointing God. In fact, the scriptures tell us that if, uh, if it hadn't been for David, God would have off the reign of Solomon. He only kept Solomon around because uh, he promised David that he would. And so again, it could seem as though from Solomon's uh, perspective, a aging in life, that he's just a rant of a cynic or that perhaps he's a, a, even a lapsed believer, but I don't think that's what's happening here. I don't think what's happening here is he's telling us how not to do life. He's telling us how life is and how we lead it in the midst of all of the things that we're going to learn. He's going to teach us about true wisdom. And so again, this book is going to be perhaps not what we expect it to be or not even maybe what we want it to be, but God is going to be disclosing to us some things about life that we need to know. And I want to begin today with a very uh, single word. If you don't get this word, I'm not sure the rest of the book makes much sense or you might have a distorted view of the book. And that one word is the word havel. It's a debated word about what the word means and I have it up here for you in, uh, in the English transliteration. And there, in case anybody wonders, is actually the Hebrew word havel. And if you were reading that in, uh, in Hebrew, you would read from right to left because the Hebrew language is read the opposite direction from the way we read. But that is the word I want you to get today. If you don't get any other word, and in fact, if you have your paper Bible here, would you take it and write it havel in the margin right next to vanity. 
Okay? Do that with me right now. Write that right in the margin. And I want everybody to say this word with me a couple of times just so we get it kind of embedded in. You ready? One, two, three, Havel. Ready? One, one, one more time. One, two, three, Havel. And this word is a really important one. And it's used 35 times in this book. And the transliter- translation of that in the ESV is vanity. If you're reading in the NIV, it is meaningless. Give me the next slide. And so again, the NIV would translate this opening verse two as meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. If you're reading the ESV, it says vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And unfortunately, I think both of those translations, which again, they're doing the best that they can. I would have loved to have been in the meeting where they were debating this uh, as they were creating the translation because I guarantee you there was massive debate about what's the best one word that's gonna capture this. I don't think that, uh, that uh, Solomon is trying to convince us that all of life is meaningless. God is, a life of, uh, God is a person of meaning and our lives oftentimes have many aspects of, of them that are meaningful. So I don't think that's what he's trying to convince us and he's not trying to convince us that all of life is vanity. Helen Reddy, I'm gonna speak to the older crowd here. You're so vain. Do, do, do. You probably think this song is about you. <laughs> vanity, is that what he's trying to convince us? That Vanity is really about a person who's just conceited and they're all about themselves. If you sit at a vanity, you're going to make yourself presentable and pretty in some way. And is he trying to say, that's what this book is all about, is just about appearances? No, that's not what he's trying to say. And so how do we get our hands around Havel? What is he saying that Havel is really uh, about and how would we translate that? Well, Havel is often translated as a wisp or a vapor or a puff of air. Havel is like a wisp or a vapor. It's like a dust particle. You remember in summer days and you're outside and you look up and kind of floating around is some dust? That's the idea of Havel. You remember Forrest Gump? The movie Forrest Gump. Again, I'm gonna age myself a little bit, but that was a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. And in Forrest Gump, there is a feather that's floating around and the feather kind of goes where it will. And that's the very idea of Havel. Havel is this fleeting nature of life. It it, 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 it escapes from all of our efforts to attain it. You can't catch it. You can't hold it. You can't box it. You just can't get your arms around it. And that's what the idea of Havel is. And you can see why, again, trying to capture that in a single word is very difficult. Now, this is a true story. I wanted to name this series Vapor. And I came up with this logo, which was Vapor, and it had some purple smoke in the background, and it said Vapor across it. And so I was asking uh, Pastor Eric, hey, give me some advice. You know, here's, the, here's the, uh, the image I'm considering. And he goes, can I be honest? I said, come on, let's go. You gotta be honest. I need, help. I need your help. And he said, honestly, he said, I think if you use that, everybody for a few weeks is going to think that this is a sermon series about vaping. Okay? <laughs> you don't want that. You don't want them to struggle over thinking that this is a ser- sermon series about vaping. I said, you know, point well taken. I think I better go ahead and choose something else. And so I, I did choose something else. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is what Solomon is telling us. Life is like vapor. Vapor of vapors. That's what this whole thing is about. And it's just We can see it, we want to grab it, but we can't quite get our hands around it. And in order to understand that, and he expands on that many times over, but one of the illustrations, one of the images, a word picture that he uses repeatedly is uh, this idea of chasing the wind. Here's verse 14, if you'd put that up for me. I've seen everything that's done under the sun, and behold, all is, here it is, ESV, vanity, I would say, all that's vapor, And a striving after the wind. In NIV, it's chasing the wind. And so again, there's two different uh, slight word choices there. 
But for this series, I thought Chasing the Wind was a clearer picture. And that's why, again, the next one, next slide for me. If you look at this and it's Chasing the Wind, that is the one that we're going to see uh, every week. And again, this idea of a dandelion that has the little seeds that are kind of coming off and they're floating off and they're kind of going where they will. That's the idea of what we're going to be exploring every week. Solomon is going to give us education. He's going to expose us to many angles of life and he's going to come to the same conclusion about all these aspects of life. They're all Havel. They're all a chasing after the wind. We should study the book of Ecclesiastes because it offers us God's view of the world and it allows us to study what he's done that's made mistakes and he's saying, hey, why go make the same mistakes? If I've already made the mistakes, study what I've done and you'll avoid some of those. That's traditionally called the dumb tax. And if somebody's already paid the dumb tax, why should you pay the dumb tax? You just learn from them and then you don't make the same mistake again. There's an ultimate advantage that we often think that we get in life by trying something and, and knowing kind of completely how it works and we try to convince ourselves that we can gain control or we can gain advantage over something. And so we're always looking for that like we're kind of chasing after the wind, thinking well, we might just be able to catch it. We might be able to unlock the mystery of something so that we can make it work. And here are some examples of how you might try to exert control or you might exert some secret advantage you have in order to make life work or make an aspect of life work. Some of you are considering a diet for this January period. That's traditionally done by many people after the holidays. And maybe you have your new diet it's the secret, you know, silver bullet diet. It uses grapefruit, that secret I, uh, element that will just, you know, melt the fat away. And so again, you use that secret advantage of the grapefruit in order to try to gain advantage. Or maybe you're thinking about this coming spring and summer and you're going to grow beef, steak, tomatoes in Seattle. You have the secret behind that. All I say to you is good luck because I've never been able to do that. I stay with cherry tomatoes because the big ones just will never ripen for me. But maybe you have that secret advantage that you have. Maybe you have the surefire investing strategy for the stock market or more recently for cryptocurrency. And so you have the secret way that you want to go about that. We're all looking for leverage. We're all looking for an advantage in order for us to make life work. Denise and I have a favorite a story of that, a favorite example of that. And when we lived in Colorado, we had a family that had kids that were kind of middle school, maybe a late uh, elementary age. And uh, it was about the time that these things became really popular. Does anybody remember what these are? Beanie Babies. And Beanie Babies were these little, I don't know, stuffed animals and uh, they came in all different sizes and colors and, and creatures. And uh, when they came out, they were very difficult to find. And uh, some of them actually went up in price quite a lot. Um, you know, you, you were finding them on eBay and it's like you bought it for, you know, six bucks and it was now selling for, you know, 30 or 50 or maybe even more if it was really a rare one. And we had a family that we knew quite well and with a straight face, they said, we are going to fund our kids' college education with Beanie Babies. How do you think that worked for them? You know, not, not well, right? Um, I have a couple of Beanie Babies, and I'm going to give these away to some kids, 11 or under today. And if you have a birthday that's closest to today, January 2nd, I would love for you to have one of these. Is that, who do I have there? Okay, you want to come and get a beanie baby? And do we have another person that has a birthday? Whoa, close, okay. It's, good. it's a birthday test off. Benjamin, when's your birthday? December what? December 19. Elsa, when's your birthday? Oh, okay. I think Benjamin wins that one. Which one would you like? Would you like the shark or the duck? The duck? All right. Very good. Benjamin, you ready? Here it comes. Can you catch? Here it comes. Ladies in the front, watch out. Coming over the top. All right, here it comes. Yeah! 
<laughs> All in the name of Beanie Babies. That's fun. Here's what Solomon wants us to hear. Control can be an illusion. Life keeps marching on. And it might look like you can control something from the outside, but oftentimes it's a chasing after the wind. And so understanding the author, understanding this key word, Havel, is critical to understanding the rest of the book. And so now let's follow Solomon as he gives us just two examples of Havel. We're gonna see many, many, many more, but he comes right out of the gate and he says, if you wanna know what I mean by Havel, if you wanna know what I mean by vapor, then follow me with these two things. I'm gonna uh, use this passage today to explore the idea of nature and the idea of newness. Those are his two opening illustrations to talk about Havel. The first one is nature, and I'm finding that in verses three to seven. And you'll notice that in three to seven, there's a lot of things that are dealing with creation that he talks about. So he talks about earth, sun, wind, and streams. And what he says is all of those things keep operating. They just... They're just like this constant motion machine. They just kind of keep on going. And he says the sun is a good example of that. There is the sun that comes up every morning and usually we're very glad for that. I, I like to see the rising of the sun. But here's what is true about that. You have no control over it whatsoever. You can't, you can't cause it to go faster. You can't cause it to go slower. You can't say today I think there'll be no sun. You have no control over that. It just is constantly operating. He says the wind is like that. The wind is always taking the course at which it takes. Jesus even tells us the wind blows where it may. And so you have no control over the wind or how the wind works. He also talks about streams. And he says streams follow this pattern. They make their way down into the ocean. Their evaporation happens and deposits that that moisture back in the hills again and that cycle just continually repeats itself again and again and again and he says that is something that we all recognize that's happening all around us and again we are not able to manage that or control that I've seen a bumper sticker that says save the planet and again I understand the green sentiment behind that I actually believe that Christians should be some of the people that are most behind ecology because Genesis chapter one and two, we are called to be stewards of this planet. So Christians, we, we should be individuals that are all about trying to manage and steward the earth quite well. But saying that, I think the bumper sticker should change and it should not be save the planet, it should be save the people. And here's why. We may do a lot of damage to our planet. We may unleash nuclear weapons, we may poison ourselves, we may make ourselves even extinct as a people. That's possible. But we will never crush God's motion in the entire universe. You're not gonna snuff out the sun, all right? The oceans are still going to exist whether you do or not. And what God has put in motion is bigger than all of us. And so again, it's reminding us about how small we are within the course of everything that God has created. We are but vapor in light of everything that God has moving forward. It's fun to watch kids build sandcastles. I've got some kids here that are building sandcastles in the ocean. And perhaps you've done that with uh, one of your kids. Maybe you've done that uh, in Long Beach or maybe at Cannon Beach or maybe you've done that down in Southern California. Uh, we've had that experience with our kids. And they build their first little sandcastles and maybe they even put a little moat around it. And then a half an hour later, you watch as the water comes in and just wipes away their creation. And they're like, what? You know, we, you know, we, we built that. And it's like, yep, that's how qu quickly it can come and it can go when you're uh, in the ocean. And it's amazing because adults seem to lose that perspective when it comes to the nature of much of life. We, we forget that many of the things that we build have a terminal time to them. They're gonna come to a close and they're no longer going to exist. And so we pride ourselves again over control of the world, but really we're not in control much at all. And it comes to the spot where we really have to recognize that about ourselves. He also uses the example of newness. And that, that, I picked that up in verses eight to 11. And he said, the ear is never satisfied with hearing and the eye is not satisfied with seeing. We're always on the alert for something new. We always want to just consume something that is new. The internet, we want to consume something new. Netflix, we want to consume something new. 
News agencies, every time they come on the air, they want to tell you something new that you have not known before. And so the ear is always willing to hear something new. But the eyes and the ears never tire because they're really never satisfied. And so restlessness is built on the inside of us in life. People are going to come, people are going to go. Fame is going to come, fame is going to go. The things that we are, think are popular are going to be popular for a while and then they're going to go. And if you need any reminder of that, think about bell bottoms, corduroy, and macrame. They all have made their appearance and they've gone. And guess what? They've come back again. My daughter for Christmas got a macrame plant holder and I said, are you a child of the 70s? I mean, what's going on here? And so they, they come and they go and styles are always changing and there's always something that's new. I want to use another example of this, of this idea of something that's new, that's just on the cutting edge. And you'll remember back in 1996 was the Blackberry. Raise your hand if you ever owned a Blackberry. One, oh, there's several that have owned the Blackberry. I did never own the Blackberry because I was not a cool enough kid. Those were for really cool people. And you'll notice that it even had the little keyboard on it. And so again, this was, and this was, this was it. And you know, it was a phone and it was a text message machine and it, it was just a precursor in so many ways to communication now uh, that's digital communication. Of course, the iPhone came around and bye-bye Blackberry. This is an interesting fact. Two days from, t from today, on Tuesday, the BlackBerry software will no longer operate. It has operated throughout this entire time and BlackBerry Corporation said, this coming Tuesday, it's off. And so it will be no more as far as the, at least the BlackBerry operating system. Some of the devices work on other software and so they might work, but it's going to end. There's really nothing new under the sun. There's always the touting that something is brand new. But in reality, it's not that new at all. I love Jeffrey Myers in his book, A Table in the Mist. And he uh, gives this dialogue that happens between Solomon and perhaps a modern day person. And this is the way he talks about it. He says, um, Solomon is moved forward to today and we're having a conversation with him and, and we say, Solomon, look at all the new things produced in our generation. And he says, where? And you say, over there. The Burj Khalifa, modern skyscraper in the UAE. Or consider our own Empire State Building in New York. Solomon says, they're buildings. People have been making buildings for the last six millennia. And if you haven't noticed, there's some pretty cool ones in the past. Well, you say, read this great novel. No one has ever written anything like it. Solomon says, Hmm, fine, it's a book, a story, but what's new about that? Show me something really new. You say, Solomon, I've got something new for you, the jet. That's new technology. That's certainly new, and you've got to appreciate that. Solomon says, you know what? I acknowledge the newness of this technology, but it has to do with travel. It has to do with transportation, and man forever has tried to transport things from A to B in a faster way, so it's really not that new, even though it's a faster way of doing it. You say, okay, I've got you now. I want to show you something that is true for us. We have computers in our lives. They're in our homes. They're on our wrists. They do everything for us. Solomon, you have to admit, that's something that is really brand new and cool. And he says, what exactly does it do? It says, you say, well... It helps you write more efficiently and calculate numbers and communicate and make models of things and organize your life. And Solomon says, well, you know, man's been trying to do those things more efficiently for all of history. He says, does it guarantee efficiency? Does it make a man a better writer? Or does it ensure accurate calculations all the time? Well, you say, well, no, garbage in, garbage out. And he says, exactly, there's nothing new. Man does the same thing that he's done since the dawn of time. He builds, he barters, he eats, he drinks, he walks, he sleeps, he dies. What leverage does mankind have over all of those things? And he's telling us something. As in everything that we think is brand new is really an iteration of something that's been in the past and all of it is like vapor because all of it is ready to come and is ready to go the way of the blackberry. And it doesn't mean that we can't do some amazing things in the sight of God or that we can't have, uh, create some things or do some things that are in honor of him. But it just means this, 
that so many times when we do something that's brand new and we are so proud of it in the moment, if we wait a year or we wait a decade and we look back, it oftentimes seems so shabby. It oftentimes seems as though, wow, I guess that really wasn't that big of a deal at all. And that's the nature again of life and it's the nature of things that are constantly moving forward and it's oftentimes a tendency that we have to try to build our lives around those things and it ends up being a dead end. All right, the journey with Solomon is gonna be about gaining wisdom and we make a big mistake if we think that wisdom means how to. And we make a big mistake if we say, I have wisdom, therefore I can run a business properly. Or I have wisdom, and therefore I can raise great kids. Or I have wisdom, and therefore I can have a great marriage. God wants you to have all of those good things, but there's no angle behind it. There's nothing that you can do that guarantees that you'll have great kids. You can do some things that are very profitable for kids and, and, are, and more than likely are things that will help them to grow. But sometimes things happen, and they're out of your control. And so with wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're gonna be learning about biblical wisdom and about how the world really works and we're gonna see how the world works and oftentimes that it's incomprehensible, it's out of control, it's inexplicable and it's very difficult to exercise leverage in order to gain advantage over it. And that's the singular purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes is to help you recognize that and to do this, to push you into the arms of God to push you into the arms of God who is behind all of this and is in control of all this in order that you might find a very level of rest inside of him rather than about your own agenda. So wisdom doesn't mean just about knowing about life but being freed really from the compulsion and feeling as though you have to be the master of your own universe. And in coming weeks, that's what we're going to be learning all about. So here's where I'd like to begin today. I'm wondering if everybody today could just begin to open yourselves to the fact that you might have a little control problem. You might have just a little bit of you that wants to control some aspect of life and you're looking for that silver bullet that if, if you could get that, then you could make this aspect of life work perfectly. And if you can come to that space of saying, I may have just a little bit of that tendency on the inside of me, then you're going to be opening yourself to what God has to say in the coming weeks because he's gonna be talking about all those aspects of life that we all live and he's going to be telling us about how we can view those with a godly perspective. Today I wanna to remind you life is vapor but God is permanent. Life is vapor but God is permanent. And in this sermon series we're gonna be learning a whole lot more about that. Lord, thank you again for your word that is always uh, beyond us, above us. We are seeking to understand you rather than trying to inform you about our world. Lord, we admit that uh, life is fleeting. Even if you just look at the span of life, most of us get about 70 years. And Lord, we just admit we are, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're like vapor. Lord, somehow you've s still seen that we are significant, we're made in your image, and so we have value. And you want to teach us about how to properly conduct life with your wisdom. In the coming weeks, we open ourselves to that end. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.